I'm Joel H. Brewster, and I'm no stranger to horror. And this is a podcast where I discuss the big and the small of the genre with the hopes of taking you from being a casual horror fan to a person like myself who's a spooky film fanatic. Today, I'll be diving into something outside of the feature film realm. It'll be an anime called Treze, which is from the Philippines, and it's absolutely phenomenal. It follows a healer warrior named Alexander Treze, who protects mankind from the supernatural beings. And it's so much more than that, and I can't wait to dive into that. With me t- today, my guest is Mick Nurse. <laughs> Sorry, I just fumbled the name there. <laughs> it's all <so> good. <laughs> Mick, I'll just get you to introduce yourself and I'll dive into it. <laughs> hey, I'm uh, Mick Narciso. I am a Filipino filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, and Mick is much more than that. Mick is also a writer. I, as he says, a filmmaker, he's a director, a producer, a production designer, and the person that got me into this as well. He runs the Geek Happy Network. And yeah, he's the reason that this podcast exists. And if you're listening to it, you got to thank Mick. Oh, thanks. How are you doing today? I'm good. This is my, I actually had a good amount of sleep today, which is something I've been looking forward to. (laughs) That's awesome. And I did too, which has been weird, but yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, I don't know how else to explain it. It's just, I feel, it's nice to feel awake. (laughs) <laughs> instead of <laughs> exhausted all the time it feels like you can enjoy the day more right like it doesn't feel like you're just like sliding through the day yeah totally uh we've been so busy with the show and moving and wedding stuff that today was one of those days where i finally decided to just not do anything <laughs> nice nice well I, i'm glad i got you here then to talk about this and yeah i'm really happy to dive into this with you yeah sweet yeah let's do it yeah before we dive into the show, tell me a little more about your background in, like, how did you get into horror? We'll get into your film background as a whole, but I just want to know how you got into horror first. Horror, yeah. Uh, it's been a pretty much since I was a kid, I guess. I was not a big fan of horror growing up, but that's mainly because I had a very imaginative mind, I would say. Um, I used to, as a kid, be able to kind of imagine these really terrifying monsters and then I almost would project it into my eyes so I would like see it in front of me. Mm. So for the longest time, I would avoid any kind of horror because it's just anything. Even was it my cousin would play a lot of Resident Evil. And when we would play Resident Evil, was it two or three with Nemesis? Um, I think it was three or two. I don't know. Anyway, the one with the big guy with the Gatling gun and whatever. Um, I would start imagining him and then there would be nights with like I just picture like a creature walking towards me and then I just have to close my eyes and all that so growing up I was actually terrified of horror because it would be too real for me but then as I grew up and I think a big part of my cousin helping me um, get through that because I would sleep over at his place and we would always just play horror or watch horror because he was a big horror fan and because of that I guess I just kind of fell in love with it and then as I got older I really just enjoyed it because I found horror to be one of the most I guess human genres of film because it's just it doesn't it's not afraid to just tell a story with a um, with a reason behind it or a very human element because almost a lot of nice horrors always had this kind of psychological or problem or personal problem that someone's going through and it's just manifesting so I always found horror is such a great genre to just understand kind of humans that way yeah that's very true and i think it's very free like i feel like you can tell any you can put any character in a horror film and there's not going to be like for example an internet outcry about it right you can put literally any person in a horror film like any demographic any background any cultural anything into a horror film and as long as it's like scary and it delivers people are very interested to learn about that person whether their struggles they've been through whether it's mental whether it's physical whatever it is so i find the genre really free that way yeah exactly i think that's a great word to say it like that horror is just so human and so free which is funny in a sense of like non-horror fans tend to think of it the other way yeah i completely agree and that's you know that's what i hope with this podcast that i can pull more people into seeing horror through the eyes that we kind of see it yeah totally so you, you were talking about this before the podcast. Uh, Treze itself, how did you said that kind of like fell on your radar, like by accident, really? You just kind of just kind of came across it. Yeah, well, um, we're pretty involved, I guess, in like the film community, both here and in, in LA. And 
um, or the Asian film community in general. And obviously this being a Filipino produced thing and it being kind of a big cool thing that was kind of original content from the Philippines itself. Um, it hit the radars of some of our friends and they showed it to us and we found out about it essentially the day after because it was released the day after we got married. Mm-hmm. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. So we were like in the middle of Whistler in a lodge and <laughs> someone shared us this uh, series and we're like, oh, cool. Um, we should watch it. And we finished the whole thing over in, a, in the whole day. So we were just kind of chilling in the lap in our couch uh, in Whistler. <laughs> we finished the whole series. <laughs> it's uh, I, I feel like anyone listens to this, if you haven't seen it yet, pause it and you can watch it because honestly, it is something you can binge so easily the thing i had was i felt like an onslaught of this is gonna sound corny but like an onslaught of cool things like it was just every moment i was in it i was like oh the concept is pretty cool and then like it just kept building on everything like that is the, like how she uses her magic to the villains to the other monsters she interacts with it was it's just so cool it just keeps building yeah that's awesome i'm so happy you're able to enjoy it because i was we, we we were watching it i was thinking this is so cool that they've been able to turn Philippine lore and Philippine mythology into a universe. Because I mean, I guess some Filipinos might see it as a whole world of creatures. I always just kind of saw them as like separate monsters that kind of exist, but never combine into this kind of universe. And I was always wondering for people who weren't Filipino, would they kind of find this confusing or would they find this fascinating? Because they don't really go too deep into explaining a lot of these things they kind of just assume that people know it and know what these are so to hear you say that you enjoyed it is kind of really great for me to hear because it's like oh cool and people kind of get it even though they don't get the full lore of everything but that that was actually my favorite part of it is not really understanding and having to like having stuff to look up after i thought that made it really really cool and another really thing just what you're saying there actually about like um Filipinos as a culture, knowing these monster, uh, knowing these monsters, mm-hmm. um, that's what I thought made the show really cool. When Treze first shows up to the first crime scene of the dead ghost, which mm-hmm. in concept alone is so so cool. Right. Um, when, when she showed up to that first scene, and there's people kind of circled around that weren't like cops. There was like people that just regular people that were at the scene. I thought that was cool because I felt like in like a North American TV series. What they would do is like the world would be so separate. I I thought instinctively that she was going to have to brainwash those people to like mm-hmm. make sure they didn't see it. But it was just accepted in this world, and I thought that was so so cool. I thought that was like a really I'm going to keep saying cool. I thought that was <laughs> a, a very interesting way to um like show that like these these monsters are understood to be uh, real within this world. And from what you're telling me, like culturally, um, uh, a lot of these monsters are still believed to be believed to be real throughout the Philippines. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's actually interesting you brought that up. I never thought of it that way, that it was a universe where just they accept that these monsters exist. Yeah, totally. Like even in the Philippines, I think we're such a superstitious country that a lot of Filipinos, I think probably including myself, still believe in a lot of these um, terrifying aspects because it's, I guess, re- sometimes it feels real for us. And a lot of us have kind of our own interactions with these things. I remember growing up, I had, because I grew up in the, half my life in the Philippines, my first 15 years in the Philippines. And I remember one of my teachers would s- mention to us that he was a ghost hunter or like a creature hunter of sorts. And all of us were like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> None of us thought he was weird. We were like, oh, that's actually pretty, pretty sick. I have a two part question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> on top of that, I had a question before, but then you said that now I have a two part question. One part, uh, the first part is, did he tell you any ghost stories? Like, did he tell you any of like his interactions with hunting ghosts? Oh, totally. He did. He would tell us all his stories and it was almost, it's, it's one of those, there's no way this is not real because it was so specific the way he explains things. Like he would talk about how he would um, go hunt for duendes, which you meet in Tresse as well, which are our version of dwarves slash goblins, I guess. And how he i the one story i remember is he was out in the mountains one day with his friends and hunting friends i guess and they were looking for duendes and they came across a mound or whatever and one of the duendes gave him 
like shoes or something or like a pair of slippers that allowed that he claims allowed him to be able to run without getting tired what yeah so it's like it feels like larping but real you know for them it's like this is something that's like they don't think this is fake it's like a real thing or these creatures would give them gifts or abilities or or weapons and stuff to help them through so it's really fascinating that Tressa came to life it's like some people still do this or there are people that exist that really believe that these things happen <laughs> yeah and the thing is too i'm from my parents are from barbados so the, it's the same sort of uh, spiritual nature over there like when i speak to like my grandparents or i speak to like uh, uncles and aunts there there's a lore behind uh, a, a man named the heart man which mm-hmm. if, if you're from barbados and you listen to this you'll know what i'm talking about it's a uh, it's a man that I think the whole lore behind him is that, and then there's a, a bunch of different stories that connect him, is that he uh, comes and he takes your heart. Is It's pretty simple. But wow. truly there, people do, they truly do believe that there. And and it's one of those things, right? I'm like, who am I to question it? Because it's it, it's so ingrained in the culture that I'm like, I, I, there's, I'm so fascinated by it. I'm so fascinated by like the, the lore behind it of, of all lore. And too, it's just like really interesting to hear. Another one before I ask my next question here is... Um, I was talking to somebody on Facebook, uh, this is really random, but I was talking to somebody in a comment section on Facebook about uh, vampires in New Orleans. And right. he and he said, it, it's one of those things that's fully believed in New Orleans that like to the point that people have met them. And he goes, he, and he said that he met one in a bar once and it's one of those scariest situations he's ever been in. And right. it's it's a, like an unarguable thing apparently in um, wh- where he was in New Orleans that he brought that up. So yeah, it's, it's I always like to hear like the lore from the different parts of the world and like, the realness behind it because i feel that uh, north america really has lost it's i shouldn't even just say north america i feel like a lot of the western world in its entirety has lost its like belief in spirituality which doesn't make it right to like lose your belief in that because no. what do we know right exactly what do we know indeed it's funny that you mentioned that in new orleans like the number of times i've been there i, I totally believe it <laughs> there's always something mystical about that city that yeah. I don't never understood, and I think maybe the history of this the city itself and all of that. Yeah, for sure, I'd buy. I'd buy that there are vampires there. Me too. I actually do buy that one because it's like, yeah, the the seriousness. And it was a person I was randomly talking to on the internet, but like I, I think he said a comment. I think that's how it started. Was he said a comment, and I'm, um, and then I just like I private messaged him like I want to know everything about this. <laughs> Please tell me everything, and then he told me a lot more. But um. Yeah, my second question here was, because uh, you just told me about your teacher, do you have any personal ghost stories or any stories uh, in reference to any characters that were in Treze or any of ghosts in general? Oh, man, I have so much. Um, but I actually will, related to Treze, this is not my story, it's my cousin's story. <laughs> so Baleta Drive is uh, one of the most haunted places, I guess, in Manila, which is where this is set. Um, I actually... Th- if I remember correctly, we live quite close to Mbaleta Drive, and you could we could actually drive down there once in a while when we're on our way to certain places in the Philippines. And that place is known to be um, terrifying. It's pretty much even as growing up, we were already told never go down Mbaleta Drive alone. Is one of the kind of things that we were just told growing up. Uh, but related to that, my cousin actually had a friend who lived in number one or number zero Balletta Drive essentially where the end of Balletta Drive is and they used to have a house there and they used to live right there and that house was this big kind of um, Spanish influenced house as most houses for are there and the their games room used to be from like or the living room I guess had this long hallway that you have to walk through that looks over the backyard of that place, which if I remember correctly, maybe had a bullet tree in it or not. I can't remember, but it's a massive backyard. And the bathroom is at the end of the the other side of the hallway. So you have to cross this hallway that looks right into the um, backyard. And I guess he went to go to the bathroom one day and started seeing some kind of creature in the backyard and uh, he just talked about like screaming and running his ass right back to <laughs> the uh, living room being terrified of that Holy shit. Uh, so stuff like that have happened um i've had myself i've had a few 
stories, I guess, in the Philippines. I've had moments where like um, in my the house I used to live before we moved to Canada, um, we had a kind of a den area where the computer was. So I, I was a gamer growing up. So I used to play games late at night. And after we leave the den, you kind of cross this little hallway to go up the stairs to go back to the bedrooms. And that hallway has this bathroom that has um, no windows. There's no ventilation whatsoever in there. It's just, it was essentially a closet that we converted into a bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember one day I was done playing games. I started walking up this hallway and the door of the, um, uh, what do you call that? Of the bathroom just slammed shut as quick as it could have ever happened. And my parents were like, what because I screamed and ran as fast as I could upstairs because it happened right beside me. Mm. And my parents just I remember coming out and like, How did you get up here so fast? <laughs> and I'm like, Well, I mean, the door just closed on me and I freaked out. <laughs> oh, wow. Because um, they were like, I heard you scream, and then immediately we heard a knock on the door. <laughs> it's like, it's a good 20 steps up, <laughs> but That's... I guess I, I ran that fast because I was that terrified. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, rightfully so. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So stuff like that happens in the Philippines all the time where it's like, I we just don't get it. Like I'll, there might be a scientific explanation, but not um, in that same house is actually also. So I, I directed my first short film was called Lolo, which is um, grandfather in Tagalog. And that one is actually based on a true story as well, which happened in that house, the mm -hmm. same house. Um, so we were just getting ready to leave for Canada at that point. So we had all our bags packed and the boxes all laid out actually in that same hallway. Um, and then one morning, my one of our, our cook, I guess, um, came up to my mom and said, oh, your dad came by um, to say goodbye just to say you know he came by last night to just check in and see if everything was okay and he said just have a good trip kind of thing um, my mom freaked out because my grandpa's been dead for like three months at that point because it was june and he died in february 14. Um, so that that story was what inspired me to actually write and shoot that first film because for me my grandparents mean the world to me so to be able to create some kind of I kind of call it sentimental horror story when mm -hmm. um, that short film was something that I just wanted to really do and try and to have all my friends support me and actually make that come to life was such a great experience. It was a very personal, uh, like a personal horror film. And it's, it, it really translated very well because I had the opportunity to see it. It really translated very well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So stuff like that happened all the time in the Philippines. Um, every, probably every Filipino you meet might have, <laughs> their own version of horror stories that kind of relate to all of this. Well, that question, well, on top of that, on, on top of the fact that like there's such a richness to the lore as well as like the real life accounts mm -hmm. and just, there's just such an interesting look at, um, I thought with Treze on how they did like the monsters as well as the good versus the bad, which was mm -hmm. another really cool thing that I thought they did was just building upon that. Why do you think we haven't had like a major, like a hundred million dollar, like Hollywood movie from the film it's in, the, in that, in that context and like a ghost story, story sort of context. Cause I think it's all there. I just don't understand it. After watching this, especially, I just didn't get it. Yeah. I don't know. I think, I, I guess in, from the Hollywood side of things, I would say they just don't think there's a big um, kind of interest enough to do a story in the Philippines about stuff yet. We're not trending quite yet in that sense, you know, but um, I think, some if if Teresa becomes somewhat successful i think that's something that could be made um there's also just not a lot of money in the philippines to do what they're able, like what japan or china is able to do in the film side of things or korea like we have some funding but the country itself still struggles to um put the money and invest in talent in the arts because we have so many other things that we're dealing with um mm -hmm. but i would love to see even just Tressa, just continue on, you know, like see what a second season could happen out of this, or even, yeah, maybe even just a standalone film, not necessarily with Tressa, but about the Philippine mythology. That would be cool. 
I, I think there's just so much there. I even with uh, I think with Tresse, there was so much that was cool. The bodyguards were two of my favorite parts. Oh yeah, and uh, I think the reveal of them because it wasn't revealed right away that they were kind of demons. I think I mm-hmm. like there was kind of like kind of hints of it, and then when I I don't think demons are the right word, but um, it wasn't revealed that they were um, I think they're the, cal- the cabal. I believe they're yeah. Called. Yeah, it wasn't really revealed what they were at first. And then when they came into that one scene and they, the spoiler alerts, by the way, if anyone's listening, um, well, if everyone for listening, um, when they came down with their guns and their masks on and they were flying, I was like, that was such a cool reveal. Like, I yeah. just, yeah, there's, there was such a slickness to it. And I just felt like, and I say this as a huge, huge comic book and Batman fan, I feel like this was like a better version of the Batman story in a, in a lot of ways, right? Like the way of like the having the uh, I don't want to say like like having the loyal group behind you, kind of how Batman has like Robin as well as well as Alfred. Everyone right. called like Tracy like their boss, and they knew that. And she, uh, she also has like the tragic backstory, and then has like a working like relationship with like a police officer. There was like a lot of elements of like the Batman sort of lore that I thought it was just done like a hundred times better. Because right. right, there was like a lot, it was a lot funnier. Uh, there was a very um, interesting um, cultural background to it. And yeah. just, I, it kept me on my toes. Like I, I especially at the, the last episode blew me away because I really wasn't expecting a lot of the twists that came out. Yeah, but right. Yeah, I just, and, and the aspect of family being so important, which was really cool too. And mm-hmm. from what you've told me with your stories just now, family obviously being an incredibly important part of like, um, of your culture. Oh, totally. Yeah. Like family is everything, at least for me, I guess I grew up with family being everything. It's like, the, especially here when they're talking about, yeah, like the bond of family is strong. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much very much part of our culture. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, actually going back a little bit when you're talking about the twins, um, Kambal actually just means twins in Tagalog. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually really don't know what monster that is. Like the, the main, what's his name? The big bad guy. Uh, oh my goodness. The Datu, um, Datu Tadak Busao. Yeah. Um, I actually can't, I don't know what his type of monster is, but Datu is just kind of a tribal chief um, back then. That's what the word means. Okay. Um, he but, he was a fa- he was kind of like their, if we're going to spin it to Marvel context, he was like the Thanos of that um, world when he kind of rolled up. Oh, totally. He just wanted to bring balance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and even actually cool with the Kambal is um, Crispin and Basilia, Basilia. Those names are actually names based off or inspired from a book by Jose Rizal, who is the national hero of the Philippines. Um, he wrote a book, Noli Matanghera, and there's a, there's twins there. And essentially their names are also Crispin and Basilio. I think the only difference with the twins is that the older twin in this show is not is the younger twin in the book. I haven't read, we're supposed to read it in like grade 11 or third year high school in the Philippines. It's part of our, what do you call it? Educational curriculum requirements, curriculum, yeah. yeah. Um, But I was, I would say lucky enough to skip it because I think a lot of Filipinos will probably agree with me there. (laughs) It's a a read. (laughs) Yeah, it's a long book. Oh yeah. That's cool. That's a a very interesting like uh, intent to those characters' names. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there's so many like just little hints like that that just kind of say it's like watching Crazy Rich Asians and really saying, oh, this was definitely done by directed by an Asian or a Chinese person, you know, like right. same here. It's like there's no way this was done by someone who wasn't Filipino kind of thing, because um, it's like a lot of these little things like calling her bossing is so funny in our sense i was actually it's sad that we watched this first in english because we didn't know there was a tagalog um version out there so we just watched this in english and i really actually can't wait to watch this in our native language and just kind of see how they played some of these nuances in our language i yeah i have a question actually on that um bossing what what, what does that translate to is that just like boss or like yeah pretty much yeah <laughs> it's, yeah it's kind of what you call it's like a in, it's almost a term of, and I'm, I'm probably going to get um, killed by my Filipino people, but it's, to me, it's like a term of endearment in a way of like calling your boss kind of bossing is like a friendly way of calling somebody boss, you know? Yeah. I, I liked her interaction with um, both the twins and I um, I, wanted, I think it's Hank. 
Hank was Hank, in. yeah. Yeah, I loved her interactions with all of them. Because mm-hmm. I feel that, that in a lot of, um, whenever you make the badass character here in like the, like North America, I feel like they're always really mean to like people that are kind of working under them. Batman, um, or Batman is just my example I'm using now. Mm-hmm. But I, I felt like that um, with Crispin and, is it Basilio? Crispin Basilio. Basilio. Yeah. I felt like they cracked so many jokes throughout the whole time. And Tresse just didn't really laugh, but just was okay with them be like themselves. And Hank yeah. too. She kind of just let everyone kind of be themselves. And uh, one of your lines actually with um, Crispin and Basilio was when near the end, when they um, got mind controlled by uh, uh, Datu uh, Talibus. I'm going to mispronounce that. Talag, Talag Busal. Talag Busal. When, um, yeah. when he mind controlled them. And then she just kind of uh, pushed back and said, yeah, but blood is not stronger than like their family bond, mm-hmm. which I loved. I absolutely oh, love totally. that line. I love that concept. I love that line. Yeah. And I think that that whole idea is something that is always, I guess, within the idea of the Philippines being so family centric, that concept is so, such a, that line itself is so deep in that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like there's so much to it, right? Like, mm-hmm that especially in the Philippines, like who is family? Is family the people who gave birth to you or the family that actually took care of you and took you in? And um, and so many di- family dynamics in the Philippines and class and um, class systems and all that. There's so many struggles and stories that come out of that specific idea. And for someone to take that idea, which I think is the central, one of the central ideas of this comic um, and kind of, bring it to life and a horror is so cool to me <laughs> you know you could take something so simple and so whatever and i think to me i guess in some ways it's so nice to see philippine content in that sense because there's always something emotional or something of the heart that comes out in philippine art despite it being this super bloody horror um, that still comes out which is so cool and I felt that they really built to that moment too, right? Like her dad showing her the whole time that like, oh no, they they were raised poorly before. They're our family now. You have to understand their family. And, mm-hmm. and she kind of pushed back about that. She didn't really want them as her family. And then when that moment actually happens at the end, it just, because because the flashbacks were perfect, by the way. Mm-hmm, yeah. So that, that flashbacks to show her story, usually it feels forced in the show, but I felt like they were so perfectly done. Yeah. And um, I, I'm going to hop back to my original idea but in a second, but I thought the flashback was showing how her dad had his own, um, his own two personal bodyguards too. Yeah. Like, like that, I thought that was a cool concept. Like they were werewolf. Would they, would it be werewolves? Would they be in, in um, I actually don't know what creatures they are, but there are shape, which are the shape shifting creatures of the Philippines. They have names. I just okay. don't know. Okay, yeah, because I was like, "Werewolf probably isn't right," but I thought that was cool. Um, I would, I would watch a whole backstory of her dad. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, everything about the shows, and that was another th- another thing. Well, both of her parents, both of her parents were like equally powerful in like just different ways. Usually, totally, yeah. it's like uh, usually it's like just the dad's powerful, just the mom's powerful, and like a lot of North American like comics and such. But um, yeah, I, I can't stop raving about the show. There's, there's <laughs> just so much to unpack about it. Um, one thing I, I would hop into about this is my favorite episode. I think it's episode four I mean, with the baby monsters. Oh, yeah. The, the, uh, the Tiana. Tiana. Right? Tiana. Yeah. Okay. It's like Cha instead of Tia. Oh, yeah. I'm going to pronounce it properly here. So Chanak. Chanak. Yeah. Chanak. One, that's the most horror centric episode there was. I thought, that oh, was yeah, I love that episode. <laughs> so unnerving, so scary. Those monsters will forever like live in my nightmares in the best way possible. Mm-hmm. And just the twist of the of the actor, um, of her when she uh, starts stabbing like the stabbing the monster and just like the, her twist. Yeah, oh, yeah, I thought that was so so unsettling. And then the last scene with them coming after her. Everything about that episode I thought was perfect. It's like mm-hmm. there's a tie for me. That episode and then um, another episode I want to get into in more detail with you uh, is the, I think it's episode five, the police retail, the police station one. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that episode too about, about like how they did talk to a police brutality and that was also mm-hmm. so well. Like there's just every episode just had something really that to like really sink your teeth into. But Oh, totally. Yeah. What, what, was, your favorite, um, what was your favorite creature from, that was in the show? What would be? I I love the twins. Like I am actually trying to figure out how to, <laughs> to um, 
make molds and cast those masks. <laughs> those masks are so cool. They're great. They're awesome. Like I just love them. Um, I think, but in terms of like the creatures itself, um, I think the Chanak is the best one because that's kind of the ones that I know of. Um, there's a, like again, the, or the Philippines has like thousands of islands, so it's always when everyone people ask me like what's the philippines like i have to our first question is always where in the philippines because i remember even for the horror show a friend of mine was working in the art department there and she was like oh you're filipino like we're doing a filipino episode we want to make sure the design is on point can you tell us more about like what kind of design you want and we're like we could but you have to tell us where this family is from because mm-hmm. someone from manila is very different from someone in cebu because it's hundreds of islands away sure it might be a two-hour flight but it's still hundreds of islands away so there's so much little nuances that change all the time so even watching Teresa, it's so cool because this is obviously the horror mythology is based on manila horror but there's still aspects of philippine horror in this which is from all around the country and there's so many of these things i don't even know of I know about the Tikbalangs, which are the horse-like creatures, but I don't know too much about them. Mm-hmm. Um, where's that scene? There's that scene where they had this kind of like meeting of the gods or whatever. I don't oh, know half of those. <laughs> that was so cool. Like, is the, you're talking about a scene where her dad met with the gods and like they yeah. did the treaty. That was like one of my favorite things that like, like as far as non-action scenes go, that was one of my favorite things. Like who, what? Tell me everything. I would like, the, <laughs> those that. are all part of our mythology and I don't know half of those. <laughs> I, I feel like that um, a lot of our, like, I feel like a lot of Western lore is based around the Grimm's fairy tales. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's not even like, it's a, it's a sliver compared to how like um, diverse uh, the culture from like the, the lore from like the Philippines seems to be. And like, I, I yeah. don't understand why this isn't like, you, you know what I mean? Like propped up a lot more because this was like such a, th- this show gave me like such a small glimpse into, the, into mm-hmm. like the lore that I'm like, okay, there's obviously thousands and thousands more stories to come from there and i'm yeah totally oh yeah like you, you talked about enjoying the chanak idea like that whole concept of a chanak is something you could make a full horror film about because oh, absolutely it's it's a discarded child that's why in some ways i think that's why she does she turns from this baby because she never liked it that's mm-hmm. the whole point of this this chanak coming to life was because it was rejected by the mother that's why it becomes a monster so the mother is continuously rejecting it Sorry for spoilers for people, but <laughs> that's uh, you, kind of the whole yeah. thing. Of That's the whole concept of the Chanuk. And it's such a cool concept and horrifying monster. Yeah. Yeah, it was like, it was one of those things where I'm like, oh, I hope Reveal like, ends up being as cool as like, because it was killing people like, like um, not silently, but it was killing people like off screen for a while. I'm like, oh, the reveal yeah. of this is going to be pretty crazy. And it was uh, way crazier than I thought it was going <laughs> to be when I actually saw him like, that is horrifying yeah that's 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 the stories they told us growing up (laughs) because i think you brought up grimm's fairy tales it's similar to us our mythology i feel a lot of philippine mythology is really born out of tales to scare your kids yeah like cautionary tales right so you don't yeah exactly don't go down that alley yeah Mm because even like tikbalangs are known to be manipulative creatures then they tell you like when you don't you don't go to the forest alone because you might get lured in by tikbalang I hope I'm pronouncing these right. Um, or the same thing with the white lady of Ballet to Drive, where the white lady's like, don't let a stranger into your car kind of stuff. Because I think the most common stories of white ladies are actually from jeep jeepneys, which are, gosh, how do you explain jeepney to non-Filipinos? <laughs> Have you seen, do you know what a jeepney is? No, I okay. don't think so. They're our version of minibuses. They're like, they're big vans, but... Okay. Oh gosh, I don't have to explain this. I, I've never actually had to try to explain this to people. They're just, they're big vans with like two rows of seats that you sit on people. It's essentially public transport. Okay. It's just known, it's it's one of those like, if, was it Thailand has their tuk-tuks, we have our jeepneys. Okay. Um, and there are these kind of van, van-like vehicles with an open door in the back where people can just, come in come out i love just hanging out of the back of the jeepney um mm-hmm. and you could sit inside and you know you pay the driver and all that it's just it's just um yeah it's just a public transit our version of public transit but we also do have buses and we also have 
tricycles, which are kind of our versions of tuk-tuks. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those distinct, I'm sure you've, in, if you watch Tresse again, and I show you a picture of a jeepney, you'll see so many jeepneys. In oh, absolutely. I feel like Barbados is similar. Um, it, it's interesting because there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm hearing now that are really reminding me of like going to Barbados because they right. have like similar sort of like small jeeps to get around because yeah. it's a small island, right? So that in, in that context, so um, yeah, they have like sort of like a small jeep to get around it, like mini buses more or less. But I, I feel like if I rewatch the show, which I'm going to, yeah. um, I, I feel like I'll catch what you're saying. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you'll probably see it by then. Um, but yeah, so there's back to the white ladies things like jeep the a common story of like white ladies are jeepney drivers or taxi drivers who pick up these white pale dre, pale women who are super white and their dresses are also white and they sit down and the idea is that when you they they sit down you you they'd ride your ride and then you look back from your rearview mirror and you'll start seeing this woman is not actually all white and pale she's all bloodied and dead mm -hmm. And that's kind of the whole idea of white ladies, but it's also the similar concept as people walking by and you see one, you don't approach it. Um, so it's kind of the idea of also just like avoiding strangers. So yeah, there's a lot of those concepts. Um, See, so what's interesting with the white lady story, and this is where I get like really diving into like uh, my own conspiracy and, and everything here. So what's interesting with the white lady story is that even in North American lore, and I think Latin American lore, they have the same concept. Like right. the exact same, like down to a T, the picking up the person, um, they're dressed in like dressed in white and then they um, become like like a bloodied creature. It's mm -hmm. like a very similar concept in like a, a bunch of different wars all across the world from mm -hmm. communities that were never like at any point uh, attached. Well, you know, before trade and before um, like the world kind of opened up, right? They yeah. weren't. And I, I find it fascinating that like there's certain uh, creatures or certain monsters throughout um lore that have a similarity by these a bunch of nations that didn't have any connection mm -hmm. um so it's like it makes you really wonder right like there's that there's um another one would be uh like bigfoot bigfoot or like or yetis right like there's mm -hmm. there's so many of those um of those style of animals that are very popular in all different parts of the world and they have a story upon them another one would be like a vampire yeah um, oh totally because in philippines has their own version of a vampire it's it is the ass ass one that's as, yeah, aswangs are like I may the class more. of monsters. Okay, They're okay. Kind of like it's like La, was it Laman Lupa, are the creatures that they had here the earth creatures? Those are actually it's more Laman Lupa is more like a term for earth based creatures. So okay. like all the duendes are all in Nunos. They're kind of like the species of the kingdom phylum class genus <laughs> okay consider laman lupa like the genus and then like duendes and nunos as the species it's the same with aswangs aswang is more like a genus of creatures or family of oh, creatures cool. and tianaks i think i think chanaks and the mananangals and all that all fall under aswangs even okay. though what's his name um Ibo. okay that the name makes of sense. a character but it's actually a type of monster as well so Okay. Do, do you know which ones I'm talking about? The ones that are kind of like vampire-like then yeah, yeah, yeah. That, fall, that fall into that category? Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like that, like that, if you go to even like, there's, there's they have the same sort of um st story in Africa. They have the same story in like um, Europe. And it's mm -hmm. one of those things, right? That I, that I, I feel like that this sort of conspiracy that goes off, right? That between that and like between like how humans have reacted to, uh, or sorry, humans have stories about like aliens, there's just so many things that connected uh, our society before we had any connection that it kind of makes you question, like, you know, whether or not, like, it's kind of hard to argue reality behind it. Mm -hmm, totally. So that's what I find, like, really fascinating about um, a lot of the lore of the cautionary tales that, like, yeah. oh, they, they sounded like, oh, they sounded like just, like, simple stories to keep you out of the woods or to scare you, but it kind of has an angle that it's kind of hard to argue otherwise. Totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, um, I have, I looked into vampires once and I found the reason or potential, there's a historic, potential host historical or scientific reason why the concept of vampires is so um, universal. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess vam by vampires, I also just mean like soul suckers or blood suckers, because um, mm -hmm. obviously our vampires today are very I think different from just that general concept and that actually 
comes more from just the nature of how dead people were and how people perceived it. Because we, I think back in the day, people never really understood how decomposition works. Mm, that makes sense. So when they started seeing bodies that had like, uh, what do you call that? Like bodily fluids coming out of it, they would take it as thinking it was blood that was coming out of people's mouths, for example. And then they would think that that person's like waking up at night and sucking the blood of other people, for example. So that's kind of how the similar concept of a vampire came out. Um, I think there was one other disease that was related to porf porphyria. Oh, let me Google this. And I've heard also too, like porphyria, connects, yeah, connects that. I, I've heard that like a lot of the vampire lore and coming out of uh, different regions of Africa was mm -hmm. uh, heavily based on like mosquitoes getting into like wherever you're like sleeping and yeah. then getting whatever disease from that, and that's like, where the second came from too. Yeah, that could be it too. Um, disease was the second thing for sure um yeah it was porphyria so that porphyria also had like this concept of like bodily disfigure it disfigures your body the disease does but also like makes you sensitive to light and sulfuric foods like garlic you know so like these things are you could see these little elements kind of oh yeah absolutely. as the backstories of oh that's probably how we came up with the concepts of vampires and then yeah. it evolved and evolved and evolved and i think I would guess some a lot of the mythologies are similar to that. So I'd be curious to see like why um, big hairy creatures is one thing, you know, or like uh, I'd imagine that the big hairy creatures. I'd imagine that a lot of that has to do with um, like animals that maybe did exist at a point because there was. True. I think it was the. Oh, I'm gonna butcher this. I think it's the Bilbo ape. I'm gonna have to put that in the show notes. But right. there was an ape that they said that didn't exist, and it was called like a leopard killer too. I'm a I'm sure I'm butchering this. We're going right. off on an ape Joe Rogan tangent here, but I like that. <laughs> um, but um, there was an ape that was, they were called leopard killers and a lot of people didn't believe they existed for a while. And they found them like, I want to say in like early thousands. And they're like, uh, no, they actually, we did find evidence of them. We actually found proof of them. So I imagine yeah. that's the same way with like a lot of uh, uh, bipedal apes that they found, right? So I'm for assuming sure. that's where that lore goes that all across and that, that they, those animals could have went extinct. Uh, yeah. Throw the time and we could still have one or two of those still existing so the concept yeah. of like bigfoot's not too and too out of the range especially and, and aliens too those ones aren't too out of the range too but i no, feel like yeah. people seem to argue a lot more like on the supernatural element which is um probably more to do with like a disconnect from the spiritual world in north america i'd say yeah yeah for sure yeah actually speaking of i just remembered one uh, this is a super tangent but i did remember one other story that kind of I've had that relates to Tressa Monster as well. Oh, do tell. So, uh, San Telmo, which is St. Elmo's Fire, mm -hmm. is what kind of that name comes from. Um, but as you could probably see when you watch Tressa, it doesn't really look anything like St. Elmo's Fire. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea, it's still called San Telmo, I think, in our mythology, but then it's really not, it's more like little fires that kind of appear in the dark rather than a St. Elmo's Fire. But it's just, it's one of those that we probably misunderstood this type of light to be St. Elmo's fire back in the day. So we called it St. Elmo, and that's how the mythology of this creature came to life. But anyway, uh, when I grew up in the Philippines, we used to have sleepovers in our schools. Um, and my school happened to be right beside a cemetery. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so the classrooms that we had were actually right beside our soccer field and that soccer field is right beside a cemetery. So, and there's a lot of horror stories in our school because some of those areas were used during the war for prisoners and for people. So there's even our own the building we slept and had this story of um, not, don't go up the stairs on your own because if you go up the stairs on your own, you might be stuck in a, eternal staircase of constantly going up and never reaching your floor and constantly seeing the painting of mother mary on every floor so that's one of the stories we had there um but the uh, my what happened to us is we decided to go on a a hike into that um soccer field in the middle of the night and it's a, this is one of those i still don't understand how this happened but it's a memory of mine and it feels so real until today but I just remember all of us were walking down there and we all started seeing a ball of fire, something like the San Telmo, like appear from the um, 
from the from the cemetery and start approaching us like super fast and all i remember is running for our lives back to our classroom and i remember seeing it looked like a like those headless horsemen people with the fire on his head um that's but, yeah that's kind of uh, that happened uh whether or not that's real or not i don't know man but that that's it's that. a memory yeah it's a memory jeez so stuff like that happened in the Philippines quite a bit. Um, we just have, and those are one of those, like, we didn't talk about this story. It's not like someone told us that there is this monster there. We just thought we'd decide to walk around and see if there are any ghosts. So there's no precedent for this mm-hmm. in our minds. Um, it's just, we all saw the same thing and it happened. <laughs> Oof. That'd be so scary. How old were you when that happened? It was great for somewhere between like 11 or 12 i think Oof. yeah that'd be so scary yeah yeah so we have like i think every filipino will probably have a story like that <laughs> yeah and i and i feel it like like again i feel like um every every Asian like Barbados has, has a story like that too it's just mm-hmm. again it's to do with the there's such a disconnect i think like i've mentioned this before with the like spiritual side of the world um, in like North America. So mm-hmm. it's always really interesting to hear uh, these stories. Um, I have a slight correction to make. I said that episode four was the uh, police brutality or was the uh, episode with the- Chanak. Uh, yeah, with, with Chanak and it wasn't. That was a police brutality episode, which I'd really like to get into with you because I think we have very similar views on what's been happening over the past, um, let's say year. Well, no, uh, a year would be such a gross understatement. Yeah, for, <laughs> for a just, long time. For a very long time. I was like, the best. Uh, yeah, no, no, year would be very gross to understand. But obviously, um, with um, a lot of the Black Lives Matter movements but, and such, I feel like that the episode um, that how they atta- how they touched uh, police brutality within the episode and how mm-hmm. they uh, they didn't they did it in such a way that they didn't make the co- one cop that I I, I got to look up his name is. Uh, Guerrero. Guerrero? Yeah. yeah they didn't take away from him being like the quote-unquote good cop but they didn't make him like seem innocent mm-hmm. but it, they made him understanding and he he made he had an apology mm-hmm. but they also didn't do a way of making it just like such like a soap op, soapbox moment for it to mm-hmm. capture what's going on in the movement right now they did mm-hmm. it in such a such a way that fit the plot told the story of what's going on on uh, with police brutality completely touched on um Mm -hmm. the horrors of police brutality and continued with the story within the supernatural world that i i i I couldn't get over how well that was done i was like that was like the chef kiss for like already perfect season because i thought they just absolutely nailed every single aspect of the show because as soon as i saw that the cops were um being like awful to that um to the one prisoner i'm like oh i wonder if they're gonna touch on police brutality and then Mm -hmm. the way that they did i was like i'm can't believe they touched on it so well in half an hour in a way that I don't think North American like television or anything has been able to do without. Um, I feel like it's a lot of clumsier done in a whole, in a lot of Hollywood things. Right. And I, and I felt like this was handled in a very non clumsy way and continued with the plot. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like a one off okay. episode, which was like rare to do in a six episode season too. So yeah. sorry, I just ranted on for a bit there. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I, 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 it pains me to say, I guess that, it is very real and very well thought of because it's very real and very much lived in the Philippines as well. Mm -hmm. And I think our version of police brutality is different, but the same in the sense of what's happening here too. It's still an abuse of power. Um, And in some ways it's one of those, it's not, it's different in the sense that there's nothing about domination or, there's no, I, I don't know, for lack of better words that I could think of, I would say there's just no colonial mindset when cops are abusing their power mm-hmm. when it comes to police brutality in our in the Philippines, but it's still very much there. And I think a big part of that is more of just taking advantage of a situation when you're struggling as well. Because it's not, I don't think police officers in the Philippines have power in the sense that they have it here in the North America, because they're also not, they don't, they're not well off, you know? Mm-hmm the police in the Philippines are very much like not even in the, they might be in like the 10%, but 
the one percent in the Philippines is like even I would fall under the one percent in the Philippines. <laughs> like, right. So like a cop, a police officer job there is like a more or less like a working poor job. In, in that oh, sense. totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, so the brutalities come out of there is just like, hey, I need to bribe you because I also need money mm-hmm. or whatever. And you know, some they have their demons and drugs or whatever, but. For the most part, yeah, because like even my mom has gone through it as well. Like she, quote unquote, ran the red light, and a police officer stopped her and was like, "Hey, you, I'll give you a ticket, or you could just give me X amount of pesos." Is kind of the deal, um, which is normal. And she, kudos to her, and I, in some ways, lucky that she got away with this because the police officer, I guess, didn't want to abuse his power too much. Mm-hmm. Uh, that she was like, "Well, either give me the ticket or just let me go." Because she wouldn't, she was not gonna go bribe a police officer, um, and he just let her go. Which is, in some ways, I was thinking about it now, and I'm like, holy shit! So brave, <laughs> so brave. Yeah, yeah. Because like, we we were taught growing up just to, we were taught the same thing with police officers. I guess that, um, that groups of certain groups of people and are like, I guess the same. Because someone told me like how black kids grew up and were taught how to behave in front of police officers Mm -hmm. and we got the same talk growing up just in the sense of like they have the gun just nod and behave Mm -hmm. when don't don't fuck with a police officer kind of thing is what we grew up with too because we've heard the stories too and for us it's more of because if you don't behave then they could abuse their power they could either kill you they could hold you for ransom it's more about it's not about dominance but about survival in the sense of like they just need the money yeah or they'd like the money greed i guess instead of dominance right it's yeah it's more of a survival thing than it is uh like a mindset thing i'd I'd find in north america with a a lot of the instances that go on right like a a lot of the instances go on this is speaking very monolithically that you see it's uh the abuse of power is more to do with like not more to do but i feel like a lot of the abuse of powers that they feel entitled to it Mm -hmm. and they also feel that like i can't believe this person's like mildly talking back to me so i'm gonna lose my mind to it yeah so i or sometimes people aren't even saying anything so it's again yeah can't really speak monolithically because every situation is very different but like 100 percent, yeah i I feel like it's very an entitlement thing more than anything though yeah because i don't think we get that um, there will be situations like that in the philippines but i don't think we get as much of that than more of just like hey just give me the bribe man Mm -hmm. Um, but for sure like rape culture is still a big problem in the philippines and the use of police officers to do that is a thing uh thanks to the current administration just vigilante groups that are killing lower level drug people is a big thing like yeah there is definitely a very different version but not neither worse nor better (laughs) Mm -hmm. than what we have here of police brutality um just a different version of it and that's why it feels i guess realist because it is like there i think police brutality as a whole is something that you know sure it might be different in each country but it's very much a real thing and something that we all get and understand especially if we are very much a part of the fear of police brutality absolutely right and it's i feel like everyone unless you're like super rich it's one of those things that it's going to happen but then if you're a part of like a marginalized group then you have to be extra vigilant of it yeah yeah i felt like even if we can i can probably in the philippines get away with some stuff like i wouldn't you know yeah like i would just probably just tell police if i got stopped like hey just tell them what family and from what people i know because then that way they wouldn't mess with you as much but <laughs> If you meet the right police officer who doesn't care about who you are or is told by another higher or stronger person not to care, then it's like, well, I only have so much power versus that. Yeah, and it's a gamble because you never know which police officer you're going to come across. Totally. Yeah. So that's why it's like, just behave. <laughs> yeah. One character I actually really wanted to dive into this is kind of a deviation, but um, mm-hmm. that I thought was really fascinating i believe her name was uh ibu the the emissary the uh ghost uh, oh character. yeah yeah i thought that she was just every time she came on screen i thought she was like a show stealing character is there a lot of lore like based around um like that emissary coming to like between the underworld because it feels like that was like more of a grand base character so i was wondering if you knew yeah 
I didn't grow up with much. Um, I personally didn't. Okay. Death, I think, for us was always more heaven and hell, but mostly that's the Catholic. We grew up more like a Western Catholic kind of thing. Okay. Like Western conservative Catholic, but I guess like there are definitely like more um, traditional Filipino rituals and Filipino mythologies out there that I might not be aware of. And as far as I know, it's very much part of um, the mythologies of the Philippines to have something like that, of like crossing life and death through a channel, which I think we use the MRT, which is the rail transit, our, our version of trains, train systems as the, as the channel of life and death, but very much yeah, the emissary idea i think is very much part of the mythology i just don't know much about it unfortunately okay that's a, that was one of those things where i wasn't sure how like because it seemed like the way that um they built up that character that mm-hmm. maybe it's just a translate thing but the, the way they built up that character i was like oh is, that, is this like a character that's just like like hugely significant in the um in the monster world i wasn't really sure but um a really cool character i just have yeah. the, the look it's i i hope that with the popularity of a show that that's a look that i see cosplayed at like future like ever like events because it's such a really cool character such an interesting look and just uh the respect that treze that was another really um thing i really liked about treze just mm-hmm. the respect she showed every single monster regardless of what they looked like regardless uh, oh yeah um what class they were and just really understood her role within the world so i thought totally there was, like, there was no monster she looked down on and she didn't look down on humans for not having the ability she had to yeah i think that is very much part of our like Philippine life in a way of, I mean, I'm glorifying Philippine life a little bit when I'm saying this, but you know, like you, that's why the whole, I think a good example of what you're saying is the tabi tabi po concept. So okay. I think you've heard that a lot. If you've watched, for those who watch the show, you'll hear that a lot said during the show. Um, and that tabi tabi po, how do you translate that? Tabi, tabi is beside. Okay. So it's like, just saying, hey, I'm crossing is kind of what it, like permission to cross, I think is, I guess, oh gosh, I'm really, I hope I'm not butchering this translation, but that's kind of how I understood what it meant is like permission to cross. So we usually say that when we think there's uh, like a duende, a home with uh, a duende somewhere close by. So even that line itself, right, kind of shows that we have some respect to these monsters and that there's some relationship there. Yeah, and that's what I, I found, like, really interesting. It was just, like, every single character. There was no one that, there was no one that Trezzy, like, started off being rude to. Did you, did you notice that? There was, like, no one that yeah. she had, like, a bad past with, really. Even the characters that didn't like her. She was always, like, very polite and respectful to every single character. But not, like, in a way of, like, submission or anything like that because everyone just what kind of feared and like, respected her but she paid like the perfect amount of respect to every single person she interacted with even the uh the awesome and insane lightning boss that i thought was <laughs> so cool such a cool like the way they did it and his son i thought like everything the way they did like that arc was like i loved seeing that um yeah, but there's like there was not one person that she showed disrespect to, which like looking back, that was really fascinating for any any um, style of superhero or supernatural show. They, there usually is like a character they kick when they're down, and there was like no one that uh, Trezzy did that to. Yeah, and I think yeah, that really I think comes from the kind of the upbringing of like respect that I think you don't get a lot of as well in North America. Like I grew up kind of that kind of embedded in our lives, like respect your elders. And all that and respect the monsters <laughs> um, so i think that's very much a cultural difference that i think should be more celebrated um, actually it's really fun speaking of that um the electric elemental was it bagion electro uh, the name itself i don't think is a real creature but elementals for sure is part of our mythology but the concept of him is inspired directly by Meralco, which is our the company that runs electricity in the Philippines. Oh, so okay. the building that that all that big like huge building that you saw, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's actually is what the Meralco office looks like. Oh, cool. So if you actually drive down and come to the Philippines and see it, you'll that's it. Um, a lot of 
I guess speaking of that, like a lot of the visuals you see in the Teresa is Manila, is 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 the Philippines. You know, like none of those are not. In, those are a lot of those are inspired very much by specific locations. Like I think, as far as I know, that that look of um, Baleta Drive is Baleta Drive. <laughs> See, that's, that's what I really love about it. Cause I feel that I've been so, um, I, I feel like I've been like onslaughted by so much North American stuff that for instance, New York, right. Mm -hmm. New York is like in everything so much. So I'm like, okay, cool. Like I've, I've seen it like in this and this and, and they just, um, but, but to see this, to see Trize and to see like a new world, that I haven't seen it. And to hear that like a lot of these places, like the power bills are real. That's yeah. really cool. I like that. I like that idea. And I, yeah, it makes me, makes it more interesting. And I can't yeah. It looks Totally. Yeah. It looks very much like that. Like the big building surrounded by a bunch of trees and stuff with a, that little driveway there. Cause we used to, there's a theater in there. You could actually watch Mar Morocco theater is a place where people watch um, theater. Okay. So you could drive in there and watch theater. We watched, I think, was it a, no, was it, was it a Oz? No, Annie. We watched Annie there one year and yeah, we did watch The Wizard of Oz there another year or two. That's really cool. Yeah, because I, I thought like a lot of these places, especially the Powerball, I didn't think that was going to be a real place, but yeah. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. Someday we'll take you, we, we'll, we'll go on a trip to the Philippines. I would I, absolutely love I that. I would show it to you. <laughs> I would absolutely love that. So tell me more about your projects. What do you got upcoming? What What's what's going on? So I'm just, we're in the middle of almost finishing a anthology series right now for work, which is a horror series i think it's the third season now called two sentence horror stories that's a really cool show i actually haven't watched most of the show but what i like about it is a lot of even though it's a lot of stories a lot of the stories are from different cultures and different it's a very diverse kind of show where there'd be an episode about a filipino a horror story about a filipino family there'd be a horror story about it um I don't know. It's a, it's a very diverse in that way. And mm -hmm. um, there are some, the themes around it are very much like themes that would probably be issues that go through these specific groups of people, you know, um, but done in a horror way. So I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of cool. I, I wish I could recommend watching it, but I haven't watched it. But as far as I know, at least this, the episodes we've done so far, I like it. I'm kind of excited to, watch, to see it in the television um sets um the story itself is based on a reddit thing or actually it was a blog thing that became a reddit thing like you remember like was it gosh seven eight years ago there were those two sentence horror stories that came out oh yeah 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 i definitely know right. the, the, the concept of it yeah so the someone just made a tv show out of it okay and is that on where is that available to watch it's a cw show oh, okay um i don't know if it's i don't think it's available on netflix but okay. if you have cw you can watch it in cw I will put that in the show notes so people can find that too. Yeah. Um, but right now, besides the side stuff we're working on, I just finished, speaking of family, we are in the middle of launching my brother's first music video because he's a musician. Um, so we did that together with some friends. Um, it was like an older brother. I'm, it's like me, the older brother, trying to do something for my little brother. <laughs> so that's happening. Um What's your brother's name, just so we can have it here? And oh, sure. Uh, where to his go. artist's name is Mar Emanuel. Um, uh, I always try to figure out how to explain his music. It's very, it's as if you're in a very beautiful jazz lounge, I guess. Oh. Nice and comforting kind of music. Well, I'll definitely put that on the show notes to make sure to promote that as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of like side projects, aside from always eagerly waiting the next episode of no stranger to horror uh, <laughs> i do do a food bot podcast with a friend we've been doing it for almost two years now um called smorgasbord <laughs> um, that one is it's just like a silly thing i do with a friend angel and her and i just talk about different uses of food mm -hmm. that are not necessarily food related so the latest episode we are about to do is um, how to kill a vampire with food which is why i know a little bit about vampires <laughs> interesting all right is that is that episode coming it's going to be coming out i'm in time. the middle of editing it right now yeah. okay so by the time this is edited everyone that's listening so by the time you're hearing this this should be in the show notes i believe 
Yeah. yeah. Um, the episode before that, we went on a like a two month break because I was getting married and she went on a trip to LA. But before that, we did want, do one of how to kill werewolves with food. So we could put that in the show notes if you want. I'll put them both in the show notes because they'll yeah. both be ready, I'd say. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, we did the horror story Lolo. Um, I wanted to do this idea of um, like a, I guess, a quarterly horror story kind of thing um, mm-hmm. called horrified and lolo and i think the first episode called playback was two of the stories i did um but then i got busy with work but we're in the middle of also finishing the sound design for the third episode which is called the open house that one will be built about around a concept of a kid who freezes to death before getting home oh wow uh, that sounds creepy and definitely right up my alley and i'm assuming right up everyone that listens to this alley. yeah <laughs> so that one that one's going to be an audio short i think we're hoping to get it launched for christmas uh, okay and then there's actually a lot of stuff that came up recently that's why i'm like thinking um but yeah that's so far what it is we're doing like a korean potentially doing like a korean drama feature film that one's not really it, it's in the works but i haven't said yes to it to, to yet so you were incredibly busy, just getting married, like 100 <laughs> projects going in here. So I'm actually happy that you got to get some sleep because it sounds like you're really busy. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I, like, I like doing things, I guess. Um, but for sure, like horror wise, yeah, I think the open house is one thing. Um, I mean, we're, we're writing uh, a little drama together. That's right. Just slowly getting there. Um, yeah. We can't announce it yet because we're still working on it. Yeah. But that'll definitely be in the works here, guys. And you'll you'll have to hear about that and have it in the show notes too. But there's nothing we can put in the show notes right now because we're still working on it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Um, I kind of want to keep making more horror stuff. Um, but I think I, I will kind of want to let the dust settle with life until I kind of decide to do another horror short or something. Um, yeah, definitely understandable. But yeah, looking for the next horror project, I guess, uh, is the, the, the short version of the answer to your question <laughs> all right let's uh wrap up here where can i find you online i know where to find you but i mean else. <laughs> um you could find my instagram as i think it's just mick n um j-u-s-t-m-i-k-n not just mick n um or you could find the smorgasbord podcast at smorgies pod s-o s-m-o-r-g-i-e-s-p-o-d uh, and then I guess you could find Geek Happy Network and all of your regular social media stuff too. But if you want to listen to the Smorgasbord podcast, it's or in all most major podcast apps out there, just search up Smorgasbord podcast or Geek Happy Network and it should show up. And it will be in the show notes, which will be interesting because it'll be in the show notes for on the Geek Happy Network website, which will link you to another link on the <laughs> Geek Happy Network website. It's never done this this one before. So yeah, but yeah it will be all, it'll be the show notes and it'll all connect back together because we're one big happy geek happy network family yeah. here. So yeah, yeah exactly. so when you click it, it's going to go to another part of the website, or you could just look on the front of the website and you'll be able to find it there. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. I've never when I was like saying that, I was like, Oh yeah, right. We're all the same website. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, actually, it's, a, it's a self-promotion within <laughs> yourself. <laughs> How that works. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I don't can't believe we haven't done this sooner. I felt like I wasn't like ready to do this until now. <laughs> I feel like I've really built myself up thanks to your mentorship to be to this part where I actually could have you on the show and have a conversation. I uh-huh. can't thank you enough. I love podcasting um and everyone else that's listening here um you got to thank Mick for this because I, I love podcasting and he helps me about, on every single episode throughout the way so i can't thank you enough thank oh you're you welcome again. that warms my heart so much i can't i can't i'm so excited for everything that we're going to be doing with this podcast me too and thank you for like and also thank you for this episode too for a uh telling about the show and be like going into more um, in depth about, about like the culture of that's behind the show this is really really cool yeah, for sure. I'm ha- I'm happy to talk about this forever. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll be definitely talking off the show too. Yeah, and everyone that's uh, to find me, you can find me at West Coast Strange on both uh, Facebook as well as Instagram. If you'd like to send me any film suggestions or shows to watch, you can email me at joel at westcoaststrange.com or at westcoaststrange at gmail.com. 
or like message me on Instagram, either way. Uh, feel free to send me memes as well. Always appreciate it. I'm always loving them. And yeah, that's it, guys. It's another episode of No Stranger to Horror. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day or night or wherever you are. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. Bye, Mick. All right, bye. Mm-hmm.